Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Coffee with Shane. Hopefully you are doing well and enjoying a good cup of coffee this morning or tea or water, whatever it is that you're drinking. And uh, thanks for joining me today. I, uh, I um, am glad to be with you again. We're going through Psalms right now, just taking uh, one Psalm at a time, wrestling with that Psalm. And asking the question, uh, you know, how does this uh, affect us? What does it say to us? How do we engage um, in the text and, and to do all those things? So uh, we're going to be doing that and uh, jumping on that Psalm uh, 16 today. And hopefully you will be encouraged and blessed by this uh, like I have been. And um, it'll be great for you. So uh, just in the... the um, uh, desire to have fun a little bit this morning. Um, I looked up one of the a, a good dad joke for us today, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pre be presenting one of those with you. Um, just because you know I'm I'm a dad of four four boys, and we're getting ready to be grandparents here soon. Um, with uh, one of one of my boys getting married and bringing a young lady into our into our home that has a, a three-year-old daughter and we have just been enjoying hanging out with her and getting to know her and so we're, we're pretty excited about that as well. Good morning everybody, good to see you. And uh, so here's my joke for the day uh, and feel free to share this because it's one of those quality jokes that I'm sure everybody will, will pass right along in the dad joke category. But uh, the joke for the, for the day is what do sprinters eat before a race? And the answer is nothing, they fast. So I'm going to let the applause die down there and um, bring you back to our our, pat our our process here of of getting ready for Psalm 16 today. I'm enjoying this process. It's been a really unique process for me um, because, I, again, I, it's it's a different pace of life. Um, studying and trying to prepare uh, to to chat with you guys and to talk about the text on a on a more daily basis. Um, and it's been very, very good. Um, one of the real challenges in this is not um, soapboxing. And what, what I mean by that is not getting on um, and, and saying something that I want to say or preaching on a particular topic or an issue that I, that I prefer or that I really, really like. Uh, good morning, Aunt Jane. Good to see you. I see Todd and Steve. Good to see you guys. Uh, I think Randy's on there. Good to see you. And uh, hey, Chris, good to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. Kathleen, good to see you guys. Um, so uh, what I'm trying not to do is I'm trying not to preach uh, like at you or preach what I want to say uh, and therefore, um, you know, do a soapbox on this. I'm, I'm really trying to wrestle with the text and, and to ask the Lord, okay, so what is it that, that you're doing in um, through David, through the Psalms, through, through this process? Um and, and, and how is that affecting my life? How does that affect me and my perspective? And then tying it to our, our current circumstances, where we're at today, and, and how do we address that those issues? So I think you'll find that in, in Psalm 16 today. It's, I'm encouraged and excited uh, because of um, where David takes us in this psalm um, and, and how well it connects with yesterday's uh, uh, process of, of looking at who God is and, and developing a fear of God um, it, 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 to be in awe of who he is, to recognize who he is so that it, it affects our view of grace. It, it magnifies our view of grace. And um, there's just a beautiful connection uh, to that today. And we'll see that as we go forward. So I'm going to begin by reading Psalm 16. Uh, you can turn in your Bibles and, and follow along with me. I'm in the ESV uh, this morning. So Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. 
Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Good morning, Dad. Uh, good morning, Candy. Good to see you guys. It's interesting in, in Psalm 16, a couple of key things that we notice. There's, there's an element of this particular psalm that is particularly upbeat and in David's life. It's one of the more positive psalms that we see, at least in, these, in the first few that we've been reading. Good morning, Shana. Good to see you. Hey, happy birthday to Gabe. That was so cool yesterday. Uh, I was in the drive-by. It was just awesome to see the turnout, the police uh, 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 parade, if you will. They escorted, uh, I don't know how many cars. It, it, we ran around the block a couple of times and there were just tons of cars there honking and, and, and waving at Gabe. So that was pretty cool and, and a lot of fun. <clears throat> um, in Psalm, we see this real positive perspective from David and, and he references a couple of things that I want to, that I want to point out that I want us to wrestle with today. Number one is the first thing that, that, I mean, he's doing the same thing. He's, he's acknowledging, um, he's acknowledging the, the process of, um, of the Lord being his refuge and, and all of these things being true and how the evil aren't going to last. But I love what he says in verse three, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And I was wondering if sometimes, uh, uh, Hey, uh, Tom and Nancy Coons, uh, that's mo uh, mom and dad to me in laws back in Wisconsin. Good to see you. Hey Giles, man, you guys, it's good to see you guys. I, I wish I could actually see your faces and say good morning to you. Um, but, but I can't. So, um, anyway, but it is, it is still good to have you on here. In verse three of Psalm 16, uh, Susan, good morning. Sorry, you guys, I'm saying good morning to everybody. I, I just, I, I feel like I, I want to say hi to you all. So, um, if I miss somebody, I apologize, trying to get focused and, and get us through the text this morning. Um, but in verse three, he talks about the saints and he talks about in whom is all my delight. And I, I, I just, I think to myself in the context of the church, do we view the church, do we view, view one another in this context of having great delight in one another? Or are we merely just the people that we have to put up with while we wait to go to heaven? And isn't it interesting that in that context, when you look at this particular verse in verse three, and then you tie it to uh, the the uh, the end of the text where David begins to talk about um, this path of life being uh, in his presence, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand pleasures forevermore. The, this beautiful picture of the the end of time being in eternity with God, and even in verse ten, referencing. In fact, we have in verse ten the reference that Paul uses right in Acts chapter thirteen. If you jump back to Acts chapter 13, you'll actually see this. Paul references this particular psalm and, and actually another psalm as well. But in, in Acts 13, verse 35, he references this. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. And he goes on to explain later in that text in Acts 13 that David did die and his body did see corruption. So this is referencing a prophetic promise of the Holy One of Jesus Christ coming and, and, and dying on the cross but being resurrected. And Paul is giving in this process this picture of the gospel. He's, he's uh, uh, sharing the gospel and, and testifying to these things and using several different texts in this reference. In fact, earlier in 33, he uses uh, Psalm 2 uh, that we looked at um, a few weeks ago. So here's, in this one particular Psalm, we see this reference to Jesus Christ coming. We see the reference to this path of life being in God, this great joy that comes from him, and how David observes the saints that he is, that he's involved with, the saints that he is walking with, and calls them uh, it actually refers to them as as this wonderful thing um, that that they, they are in whom is all of my delight. So he has this great delight in the saints that are involved in this. And I was kind of wrestling with this, saying, okay, so 
what is David looking at in this particular psalm? Obviously, he's seeing uh, God's provision. Uh, you know, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and in the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord also before me because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be shaken. I mean, he references the beauty, the, 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 the presence of God, the effect that God has in his life, even though we know in other psalms we see the lament, we see the despair, we see the, the difficulties that he's experienced in life. And, and, and yet he keeps bringing us back to this process. So as I was wrestling through this, I thought, man, if he's tying this to Jesus, if he's tying this, 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 this psalm, his hope, to this coming Holy One, to, the, to, the, to God himself and to his preservation, um, and we see the connection into Acts about Jesus and his salvation, um, I, I, when I hit verse 11, all of that stuff kind of culminated in my own heart. And I said, you make, the text says, you make known to me the path of life. Now, where do we see that text, um, that this idea of the path of life referenced in um, scripture, in Jesus's di uh, dialogue? Well, it's in Luke 23. When we start thinking about that David is speaking to God here and saying, you make known to me the path of life, how how to get to, how to experience being in the presence uh, as he continues that verse and being in his right hand. He speaks of this, this picture that we see fulfilled in Jesus. Now, what does Jesus say about this path of life? Um, turn with me, if you will, into, to Luke chapter 23. Luke 20, 23, um, Jesus is specifically speaking to the criminal on the cross at this point that's being crucified next to him. And he's talking about being in his presence. And that's what we see this. I'm going to, I'm going to get to the path of life. I apologize. I've, I've, I've reversed them just a little bit here in the notes that I took this morning. So I am sorry, but I think this is the, the, the way we're supposed to go here. So the, what we see in Luke 23 is Jesus is on the cross talking to this the, the criminal next to him, and they're being crucified. Verse 23, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 23, verse 43, um, and Jesus says to this man who is, um, who is crying out to him in verse 42, says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In that moment, it's interesting to me, the part that has always jumped out to me is that he references being with him, being in his presence. And here we see David talking about being in the presence of God. This path of life that, that clearly, this path of, path of life is leading to being in the presence of God, which is one of the great, um, one of the great privileges, I guess. It's one of the great uh, rewards of our relationship with God. In fact, we see that referenced in Revelation 20, uh, 21, uh, verse 3, uh, where, where God himself says, I will be with him, I will dwell with him, I'll make my dwelling place with, with man, with these people, and they'll, I will be their God, they will be my people. This beautiful picture of God saying he's going to dwell with you and with me, make his dwelling place with us. And so this idea of, of being having fullness of joy because we're in his presence is a spectacular thing. It's, it's the reward. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, um, the crown jewel of the whole process that Jesus has gone through um, to make a way for us, to come to God, to restore our relationship with him, to, to purify our sin, to wash it away. Um, we looked at that last week that, that God says he's making a new covenant, or yesterday, actually it was yesterday in, in Jeremiah 31, he's making a new covenant that will, when this new covenant is established and completed, he, he, will, not, he will remember our sins no more. They'll be done with, done for, taken care of. Um, what an amazing, amazing thing. And so when he says, you make known to me the path of life, this is where I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. I, I thought to myself, where does Jesus speak of the path of life? Um, now, this part is where it got a little bit, it gets a little bit convicting for me and, and I, hopefully for all of us as we wrestle with this truth. But it's in Matthew chapter 7, um, which is an amazing text, but it's also at times a very difficult text. 
Because when we get into Matthew chapter 7, we begin to see Jesus talking to religious people, talking to the Jews um, and, and the Pharisees as he's preaching to them uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And he continues to teach. He engages with them and begins to challenge them on the authenticity of their relationship with God. And we see that because he's addressing heart issues and he's doing all that stuff through Matthew 5 and 6. And when we get to 7, we're going to pick up in verse 12 and follow along with me in your Bibles. Hopefully you have your Bibles out. Matthew 7, starting in verse 12. And we're going to finish out all the way through verse 23 this morning. And it says this, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. And then he begins to, to challenge the, 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 those who are listening to be very, very careful with what you're hearing. Watch what you're being taught. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased trees or tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. And then he wraps up that whole that whole statement in, in this context, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Um, and then he continues on, uh, and you want to you want to finish out and, and read there because he talks about those who hear the words but does uh, who does them. It's like building a house on a on, on a solid foundation. Those who hear them and do not do them, it's like building your house on sand. It, it this this picture of this relationship, this path that leads to life, that leads to the presence of God, where there's fullness of joy. He he Jesus himself references how this works. And, and speaks to us about the, the how we should see this as we're going forward. Um, and and the, the, the most significant thing, I think, as we consider um, the, the pathway process, is that the pathway is narrow that leads to this presence of God. The pathway is narrow, and not many find it. That's what he says in Matthew 7. He, not many will find it. This, is, this, this walk with God, this process of being in his presence, is not a wide open, easy path. It's a straight path. It's a narrow path. And there are those who will find it, not by their own doing, but by that of the work of Jesus and the work of the Spirit in directing them. And, and after he gives them this admonition that the path is narrow and, and few will find it, he says, beware of those who come and who are false prophets and judge them by their fruit. Now, I'm not in this moment going to suggest to you that we run around as fruit inspectors. I know we've, um, I've heard that terminology used before, but I, I'm not going to suggest to you and I that we spend our time inspecting other people's fruit. I think what we should be doing in this moment and what I believe that, that, that we as a church should really focus on is first inspecting our own fruit and to say, is the fruit in my life reflect that of what Jesus is, is teaching us in us, uh, Matthew 5, um, and, and through the Beatitudes and, and all the way through 6 and, and through chapter 7. Has the church become just a place that we come and engage and we pretend, we, we put on the appearance of righteousness, the appearance of church stuff, even to the point where Jesus in Matthew 7, uh, 21 through 23 speaks of um, those who are going to profess to have done these things in the name of the Lord, even re uh, referring to um, healing and casting out demons and prophesying, I mean, doing all of these magnificent things. And, and, and Jesus says, depart from them, I never knew you. Because the process of being in his presence, the process of the path that leads to life has something to do with knowing God, with, with responding to his word and living in, in, a, in obedience to the things that we read in the text. And so the, when we start to think about David and how he's engaging with the culture that is around him, 
He speaks about the sorrow of those who run after other gods. He speaks about this culture in verse 4 that had, that drinks, that they have their, their own offerings. He doesn't even want to mention their name. And he, then he, he turns the, completely turns the, 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 the direction on that and said, The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup. You hold my life. He is re, he's turning the, the perspective around um, back to the Lord, back to who God is and who he is as one of God's children. And, and I love that in the middle of that, he referenced his delight in those who belong to the Lord. And as I was thinking about this for, for us in church, thinking about this for us, even, even in this culture, um, in, in our current circumstances, it, are we as a church, are we as the church, um, delighting in one another? Do we, do we see one another as the delight of the Lord? Do we recognize that the path of life, the path that leads to the presence of God is narrow? And that we need to, to take seriously our own inspection of our own fruit and, and to, to look at our lives and say, do we live in a way that reflects the, that we know God, that, that, we're, that we are um, in submission to, in obedience to, living in a way that reflects that when we read his word, when we see what he says about, about truth and about the darkness of our own hearts, that we respond to that. Or is church merely just a, a, a weekly gathering, a social event that we come and we, and we put on the appearance of these things while we're running after other gods? Other things that would actually fill the place of the Lord. Um, I, think, I think of that, I, I wrestle with that in my own heart often, is um, am I in idolatry in my life? Do, do I hold so tightly to... Um, to th this, my possessions or my freedom or my comfort or my my preferences or um, I'm you know I'm trying to think of all the different things that that I would that I would probably fight for or contend for or or maybe even maybe even um, exclude others in my life because of uh, you know I, I again just thinking of this in a church setting. Can't tell you how many times I've been in debates with uh, different people over things that, in my opinion, aren't that significant. They they don't they don't change eternal outcome, uh, and so I, f I find myself if I'm not careful, I'll avoid those people so that I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to engage in that conversation. And if if I were to be honest and and you know evaluate how I see people from time to time. Um, I'm not always, I don't always see them as being my delight. I don't, I don't recognize them. I, I really do at times, not always, but at times, um, I see people as the, the hurdle, the obstacle or the, um, the, the, the suffering that I have to endure while I wait for the Lord to return. And I hope that that sounds horrible when you say it that way, but isn't that kind of how we live in the church? Isn't that kind of how we we deal with even God in his um, in his description of, of what it means to be those who follow him? Um, are, are we living in obedience? Do we do we treasure his word? Do we read what it says and go, oh, my goodness, you guys, my life doesn't line up with this. I have to change my life. Or, or do we just stop reading that text? Do we just stop hanging out without with the people that that either offend us or, or bother us or or maybe they convict us because they're, they're actually challenging us to live in a way that reflects the glory of God. My conviction is, my heart is, I, I want to be on the narrow path. I want, I want Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful. I want, I want to be received and, and hear the Lord say, I know you. Come in, welcome. Um, and so, in that line, in that line of thought, I want to be very careful to inspect the fruit in my life. Um, you know, because Jesus seems to have this idea that good trees don't bear bad fruit, and bad fruit comes from bad trees. Um, it's, it's a it's a difficult um, perspective to really wrestle with. Because it, on one hand, you have to really embrace the grace of the cross then, right? Because if we look at our lives just on, on, the, on the 
the outside, the, the external um, actions of what we do, we can find ourselves being very discouraged because uh, as much as I want to pursue the Lord, I, I, have, I have those explosions of my flesh where it jumps out in, in the way. And, and I, I stumble over those difficulties and I, I run into them. And the worst part is, you guys, there's times where, where I realize afterwards that I've, I chose the idolatry. I chose um, to, to, as the Bible says, to prostitute myself, to, to sell myself out in relationship to something else while neglecting my relationship with the Lord. Um, and, on, and in reality, um, this whole time of getting up and being with you every morning and, and being in the Word together has really reflected or, or exposed that I can very easily short sale myself or, or, or substitute my time with the Lord for a multitude of other things. Multitude of other things. And, and, and be okay with that. Um, and, and I, I, I think that in that sense, we're, we're not, uh, we're not really seeing God for who he is. We're not really responding to him. He, he's not, he's not truly on the throne. We could almost say that when we're doing that kind of stuff, when we, uh, exchange our worship of him for, for other stuff that we really are running after other gods, we really are being idolaters and, um, so I, I really wrestle with that um, because I can quickly get distracted and, and quickly become um, consumed by other things. Um, so that's just me wrestling with this stuff. I, I want to I encourage you and challenge you to, to, to take verse 3 this morning, take verse 3, look at verse 11, and really wrestle with those two particular verses. Am I delighting in the saints? Is, is, do, I, do I gain great joy from my gathering with my brothers and sisters in the Lord? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I, what we should ask is, am I one of the people that makes it difficult for us to gather and enjoy one another? Um, it, but then also to ask the question, man, are, are, have, do we know the path that leads to life? Are we in such a deep, meaningful relationship with God that, that we can speak like David says? You know, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do we know God in that way? Do, does our relationship with him cause us to have, be, to have fullness of joy and, and to anticipate the pleasures of his relationship, the pleasures of his presence and, and him dwelling with us forevermore? I would like to say yes. Um, that's my hope. That's what I want. It's not every day. And um, I believe it's growing because God is... is um, using his word to to dig down deep in my heart on on a daily basis to say Shane let me show you who I am let me let me expose the stuff that's in you that needs to go away because of who I am and and let me show you how I can help you do that um and I I hope I hope I haven't discouraged anybody um I, I, sometimes I get worried that as I'm wrestling with my own stuff and and I can get I can get kind of discouraging in this process because um, every time I see the, the blackness of my own heart, I see uh, and I see how, how quick I am, my propensity to be an idolater and to run from the Lord, I get really frustrated with myself. And so what you guys are hearing, you're hearing me kind of wrestling in my own heart, even with the text that I had planned to talk through and I kind of wrestled with earlier as I'm talking with you, it's, 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 um, what is it doing? It's it's even ringing my heart more, uh, and, and challenging me um, as I'm doing this. So, and would you do me this great uh, favor and and really take a few minutes and read your Bible um, today with the idea that you want to be able to present it to someone else, that you want to share this particular text, what God is doing in your heart with someone else. Um, I think you will find it will really overwhelm your heart. And, and it could be something that God could use uh, in a long-term development process uh, to, to, to open up, to deepen your relationship with him, and to bring profound and transformational change in, in how you live daily with the Lord 
in the midst of all these all these things. Keep your eyes on the word. Keep your eyes on the Lord. God is still in charge. There is hope in this day, and we will soon be gathering together and, and celebrating all of the goofiness of the last couple of months. And by God's grace, we will be able to be more effective in our gospel presentation and how we live as a church because of what we learned, uh, what, what we've learned over the last month of being isolated from one another. Hopefully, we're learning how much the value, uh, how great the value of gathering together is as a church, what the, what the great beauty of um, the, the physical fellowship of the body, um, of seeing one another, of caring for one another, of, of praying for one another, of encouraging one another, of sharpening one another, uh, of, you know, the friction that happens between us and how, that, how God uses that to help us sharpen and, and to be more effective for him. May God bless you today as you pursue him and uh, continue to chase the text all week. You guys get in the word, let it permeate and transform your life because that's what God's intending to do for each one of us. God bless. I'll see you later.